All right, folks, we're going to wrap up the module by uh, doing kind of some quick hitting reviews of some of the ways that correlations are commonly used in the real world and uh, some of the flaws uh, that uh, using correlations can have, some common mistakes that people can fall into. So we'll start with some of the ways that correlations are used, and correlations actually tie into some of our major concepts from methodology. Remember our old friends reliability and validity, you'd better because there's about a 100% chance they'll be on the final somewhere. Uh, so, you know, write that down. Uh, but correlations are used to calculate especially reliabilities, but also, also validities as well. So we can calculate reliability with correlations. Remember iterator reliability. We can try to figure out if our two raters are assessing the same variables in the same way. Easiest way to do that is to measure both of our raters and correlate their scores. If they're highly positively correlated, we have good iterator reliability. If they're not, we don't. So we could have two people rate how aggressive a kid is on a playground. If they are consistently rating that behavior similarly, there'll be a high positive correlation and your iterator reliability is good. Test retest reliability, where we make sure that scores are consistent across multiple uh, versions of the same test. The easiest way to do that, you give people the same test a few times or a couple of times and you correlate those scores together. Again, a high positive correlation indicates that you have good test retest reliability. People are scoring consistently. We also use those correlations for validity, for the accuracy of what we're assessing. Does a test measure what it's supposed to measure? Uh, there are a few ways we can do this. One common way of establishing new measures, like say a new questionnaire to measure self-esteem, is to calculate what's called convergent validity. What that basically means is that I would take a established measure of self-esteem, I would have people fill out that measure and have them fill out my new measure, and then I'd correlate their scores. If those two uh, questionnaires are assessing the same things, you would want them to correlate very strongly together. Uh, so if they aren't correlated in a strong positive way, they are probably not assessing the same things, which suggests that the accuracy of at least one of them is not very good. Uh, we also can correlate things that are similar but not identical. If I created a vocabulary measure, it should correlate pretty strongly with a measure of reading comprehension. Here's one side note to keep in mind. We wouldn't want measures to correlate perfectly, which seems kind of odd. I wouldn't want my new self-esteem measure to correlate perfectly with an established measure. Why wouldn't I want that? Give that a thought for a second. Well, the reason why is if they correlate perfectly with each other, what the heck's the point of the new measure? Where's the added value there? The only way it'd be useful is if it was, say, shorter or cheaper to administer or something practical like that. But in terms of a better measure of self-esteem or whatever you're trying to measure, uh, perfect correlation suggests you're not measuring it any better or any worse than the old measure is. There's not a lot of necessarily purpose for your new measure. So you want them to correlate strongly but not perfectly. The flip side of convergent validity is divergent validity. This is making sure that you're exclusively measuring what you're trying to measure. There aren't any confounds leaking in there. If I create a new IQ test, it should correlate pretty weakly with a measure of self-esteem. Uh, if they are strongly positively correlated, now I'm concerned that I'm accidentally measuring both at the same time, and I don't know if a high score measure uh, represents high intelligence, high self-esteem, or both. Finally, to try to kind of externalize our results, uh, to make sure both that we're assessing what we're wanting to assess and that we can generalize beyond our measurements, we want to make sure the things we're measuring correlate strongly with actual real-world behaviors, which are usually what we're trying to figure out and predict anyway. When you fill out a self-esteem questionnaire, we're not interested in assessing how you fill out self-esteem questionnaires. We're trying to tap into actual behaviors that are related to that construct. So criterion validity is trying to bridge that gap. Connect your measure with specific real-world behaviors. So for example, scores on a lab aggression task should at least theoretically correlate strongly with people's uh, incidences of real-world aggression, like their violent crime convictions later on. Uh, so that would suggest that, again, that lab measure is tapping into the same sort of thing as those actual aggressive behaviors. So when do we tend to use correlations overall outside of the methodology stuff? Well, a lot of times we do it when there are variables that are hard to manipulate, 
or impossible or, Im or unethical to manipulate. If I want to measure people's socioeconomic status and their IQ, I can't manipulate how smart people are. I can't manipulate what kind of economic background they grew up in. All I can do is measure them and see how they're related. So again, when we can't manipulate one or both of those factors for whatever reason, you're not going to be able to get cause and effect. Correlations are the best that you get. They're great for offering predictions, which we're going to learn about in our next module using that regression framework. If you know the level of one variable and how it correlates with another, you can predict with some accuracy that score that maybe you don't have yet, that maybe doesn't exist yet. So, the other thing that we can do sometimes, we cannot determine causality, but sometimes we can rule some out. We can look at, say, how two variables are correlated over time. Do, do, do people's scores on our x variable at time 1 correlate strongly with their scores on the other variable at time 2 later on? Let's say that I measured how many hours that you're studying at the beginning of the semester in your final grade, and I found that correlated more strongly than your grade on the first assignment correlated with your studying habits later on in the semester. That's a little bit confusing there, but what I'm saying there is that how much you studied early on is more predictive of your grades later on than your grade early on is predictive of your studying later on. That's some support for the idea that a correlation between studying and grade is probably more likely to be your studying habit causing changes in your grade than your early grades causing changes in your study habits. So we can rule out directions of causality, but we can never confirm causality. Sometimes it's a good starting point. One of the reasons we can't confirm causality is that correlations are susceptible to extraneous variables. Two variables could be very strongly related, but neither one of them might be causing the other. For example, there is a positive correlation, it's a little morbid, between ice cream sales in a community and drowning rates in those communities. However, neither one of those is causing the other. Eating more ice cream isn't causing more drowning. Drowning more isn't causing more ice cream sales. Instead, there's a third variable that's causing both of those. Can you guess what it is? It's temperature or heat. When it's hotter outside, people buy more ice cream, and they tend to swim more, which unfortunately leads to more drowning. When it's colder outside, people don't buy as much ice cream, and they don't go swimming as much, so swimming-related accidents drop. Additionally, some correlations can be what's called spurious. These are correlations. There are two things can be very strongly correlated, but it's totally coincidental. They're not directly linked. They're not even indirectly linked. They just coincide. There's an entire blog called Spurious Correlations that looks at stuff like that and finds really strong correlations for things like the divorce rate in Maine and the per capita consumption of margarine over here at 10-year period. Very closely correlated with each other. Neither one of them is causing the other one. People aren't, you know, their spouses aren't, you know, buying not enough margarine in a year, and they're like, well, okay, uh, so I'm a little bit happier with you. I'm less likely to divorce you. But if you buy too much margarine, uh, I don't really trust you anymore, and so now we're going to get divorced. You know, that doesn't really make sense. You come up with some wacky explanations, but those two things are correlated very strongly for purely coincidental reasons. Another possible flaw in correlations, sometimes, accidentally or not, we can wind up with what's called a restricted range. That's a correlational analysis where we, again, accidentally or intentionally only measure a limited subset of those scores. So let's say, for example, we're correlating foot size with age in children, but we only measure kids in a first grade class who are about six years old. If the full correlation here is a very strongly positive one, but we're only capturing people between these two bars, it's going to make it look like a much weaker correlation. If we're looking at the correlation between ACT scores and GPA, but we're only measuring people above a certain threshold on the ACT, we're not capturing most of the range of scores, and our relationship is going to look again weaker than it actually is. So when we accidentally only measure a subset of people, or deliberately, we usually wind up with a, a correlation that looks weaker than it actually is, like the example of only measuring the foot size of our six-year-olds. A little bit more. Uh, we've mentioned effect sizes in some prior modules. Uh, correlations also have effect sizes, but the neat things about correlations is the correlation itself is its own measure of effect size. Generally, the rule of thumb is if you have a correlation greater than 0.5, it's considered a large effect size. Greater than 0.3 is medium. Greater than 0.1 is uh, small. 
The reason why this is so important, with really, really big data sets, almost every single correlation is going to be significant, but it might not be that meaningful. You know, with a data set of, say, tens of thousands of people, you can get a correlation of 0.02 that's significant, that's highly significant. That's not a really meaningful correlation. It's not a very close relationship between the two, even though it is statistically significant. So effect size can give context to that. Additionally, something that's only kind of a bit of trivia in this course, but becomes really, really important in more advanced models, you can use a correlation to create what's called a coefficient of determination. This is a number that tells you how much variance in the scores the correlation can explain. Explaining more variance is kind of the holy grail of prediction models. If you can explain 100% of variance, you will make perfect predictions. Realistically, again, we never really get to that point, but the closer you get, the better your predictions are. Stronger correlations account for more variability, more variance in the scores, and that's why the predictions are better. Again, conveniently, it's super easy to do this, the coefficient of determination. Just take your correlation and square it. Notice that a negative correlation becomes a positive number here, and again, it reflects the percentage of variance that you are explaining. So if your original correlation was 0.5, you square it, you find that you are explaining 25% of the variance. All right, our point of emphasis number two, and then we'll wrap things up pretty quickly. Uh, any two variables can be correlated, even though not all of them can use Pearson's R. We could correlate IVs and DVs if we wanted to. We're not really going to do that. It's not that useful, but the point is that you could. We use, again, as we mentioned, we use correlations and methodology to establish reliability and validity. When one or both variables are restricted in range, our correlations tend to become more inaccurate, and they usually show weaker relationships than what actually exists. This can happen intentionally, which is bad, or it can happen in ways that are very subtle or not deliberate, which can be sneakier, harder to catch. Correlations sometimes really do represent causal relationships, but that uh, mantra of correlation does not equal causation is there because a correlation is not enough information to confirm this. You can rule out some cause and effects, but you can never pin, it, pin down exactly one. This is the single biggest way out in the wild, out in the real world, that people will misrepresent or misinterpret research findings. They'll take correlational findings and conclude that they are confirming some kind of a cause and effect explanation. They don't. Correlations also provide their own measures of effect size, uh, as we mentioned, and you can tell how much variance is explained by just squaring them. This is going to matter a lot if you get into graduate programs. You're probably going to be dealing with, uh, at graduate level stats, how much variance is explained. All right. To wrap things up, again, we're modeling the average relationship between two variables. Pearson's R requires at least interval scales, but that's a pretty safe bet. And what we're going to learn in the next module is how to use them for regression to make predictions. We've also learned about how to conduct hypothesis tests and estimate effect sizes, just like with our other hypothesis tests. All right, that is the end of our module, which is good because I'm losing my voice a little bit here. So we're going to wrap things up. Uh, do your practice quiz, do your homeworks, and then come back for the 13th and final module of the course, uh, Regression and Prediction.